Welcome back to Trailblazing Women Veterans, a podcast series that shares the stories of women veterans and their contributions in American military history. We are on episode 404, and the one and only OG Ashley Grabolsha here, the original Tango Alpha Lima podcast host, and I am joined by the one and only Jeff Stouffer, Media and Communications Division Director at the National Headquarters in Indianapolis. Ashley, it's always a pleasure to be with you, my friend, my fellow advocate for veterans, uh, one of my favorite women veterans to speak up and all you do. I think appreciate you more than more than you know. Um, in honor of Women History Month this March, we've just designated that the middle of each week would be Military Women Wednesday, the day we're going to bring you remarkable stories of service, sacrifice, and strength that span our nation's history. And make sure that you subscribe to our podcast and newsletter at legion.org slash Tango Alpha Lima so you don't miss a single episode. All right, well, let's get into it. Welcome back to our final episode. And today we're going to be honoring Shoshana Johnson, the first Black women POW in U.S. history, whose story is often overshadowed by the media attention given to others. Well, you know, and it just kind of set the stage, you know, we, we've talked about this a little bit, but the start of the 21st century began a new era of warfare with the global war on terrorism. And during those early years, you know, there was a lot of policy themes that started to emerge. You know, the primary focus was countering terrorist organizations, particularly Al Qaeda, following the 9-11 attacks. And then there was the significant policy change that combat exclusion policies were gradually and officially removed that ultimately allowed women to serve in combat roles. Now that that was a, a, a long, slow arc to get to in 2015 when the when the final policy change was was made that opened up virtually all combat roles, all roles in, in the military to women. Um, but it did uh, play pave the way for vital roles in special operations and you know, we talked about the C the Navy SEALs and the Rangers and conducting covert operations, intelligence gathering, counterterrorism. Um, but you know, early in the war, you know, you had to ask yourself, what was it combat? You know, really the and I think that uh we discovered very early in the war, I think in the at the time of Shoshana Johnson's story, that this was a different kind of war and it was a war without a front without a without a it had uh, it had a lot to do with if you were in theater you were in combat and you were in danger absolutely and having someone who is and would not serve until raising my right hand in 2011 it's interesting to even sit in my own place in the history of this particularly as we built out the historical timeline of this first decade to think that anyway enough about me just thinking about my place in history you know well, you're, humble you, and true you, here. you are in that history I'm, for sure and it's it's wild because i've had this conversation with other women veterans of of this time and space in the past you know 20 years of um global war on terrorism and you don't ever really realize you're in history or while it's happening and as you move forward as we've discussed, again, making this list, I was like, man, I know some of these women on this list. And I think, wow, I joined at a certain point. And that may be the thought of a lot of folks who are going to tune into this episode. And as we shed more light on Shoshana Johnson, who was born in Panama, and she ended up moving to the United States with her family when she was five. She is an example of somebody who has come to America for a better life, joins the military for opportunities, and is serving in such a, a fascinating time in the 21st century. Uh, interestingly enough, her father was a drill sergeant in the U.S. Army, and the essentially was instilled with a sense of duty and discipline. So after moving around due to her father's military service, she eventually settled in El Paso, Texas, where she ended up becoming stationed at Fort Bliss. Right. So... Uh... Shoshana was a, as you say, the the daughter of a of an army of a soldier of a drill sergeant, and she was, you know, instilled with a lot of discipline, taught, shown how to, how to, how to and was raised right, and then she was a, uh, 
she was followed in her father's footsteps. She really wanted to go to culinary school. She wanted to be a cook. And the military, she started in college, but that wasn't going to be her gig. And so she switched gears and she said, I'm going to join the, I'm going to join the army and build a, uh, uh, make my, uh, apply for, you know, a job in food and food preparation to cook. She was an army cook. And, um, you know, she was in the 507th maintenance company and they're the ones uh, that famously got uh, kind of bogged down in one of the convoys early in 20, in 2003. They had, they had been deployed to Kuwait and um, they were neither well equipped. They didn't have, they were not very well trained for combat conditions. They had a lot of issues. Um, it was a, it was a, kind of a kind of a terrible situation and their convoy their their truck got bogged down due to in part sleep deprivation and they got lost and they ended up um in a very very unsecure area in Nasiriya. So that fateful day was March 23rd, 2003 while en route to Baghdad the 507th was ambushed in say the name it was Nasiriyah. Nasiriyah, Iraq. So despite attempting to return fire, their weapons malfunction, as you stated, and they were overwhelmed by Iraqi insurgents. Nine members of the 507th were killed, and Shoshana, along with others, were captured. She was beaten by her captors, who were surprised to find a woman in the U.S. Army uniform. Shoshana's injuries included bullet wounds to both angles, ankles, and after 22 days in captivity, the Marine Corps Delta team rescued her and the remaining members of the 507th in Samaria. Yeah, this was a this was a, a terrible moment in um, in the U.S. effort in Iraq, and they were, uh, you know, she she described uh, it to PBS in an American veteran documentary what it was like. She they they basically she she tried to hide under or tried they they tried to you know conceal themselves underneath the vehicle. And then she quote, I feel someone grabbing my grab my legs and drag me from underneath the vehicle and they start beating the daylights out of us. My Kevlar, my helmet falls off and they see my braids and then they step back like, what the hell? And I guess they realize I'm a female and they open up my flak vest and I'm wearing a t-shirt. So they see boobs and they're like stunned. And then I'm immediately separated. They drag me to a vehicle and they just push me into the vehicle and they take off. She had been shot. I'm not sure if it was shot twice, but she was shot in the ankle once. And I think it went through the other ankle, but both ankles were wounded. And I think she was, they had, they had to do surgery on her. The Iraqis did surgery on her. I think while she was in captivity, when the Marines caught up with her and they were able to pull her out. And this was the 507th was the, was the same uh, company that, you know, private first class Jessica Lynch belonged to. And her story got so much uh, play and it's, and it's very interesting and not, not to take anything away from what she went through, but these POWs, these early POWs were moved from place to place by the enemy and they were uh, beaten in some cases or else, they were they were they were uh, mistreated for sure, but at the end of the day, they were rescued by the Marines. And um, nine of these people of of this that were caught up in all of this were killed. And one was and they they um, Shoshana wrote about the story in her book. I'm still standing, from captive U.S. soldier to free citizen. My journey home, and that was in 2010. But that was a long journey for her to 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 go through and i don't want to you know i i her story can go can is is one that continues today and um i i do know that uh that her her experience led to changes the experience of that unit led to changes in the military yeah it, it's fascinating um we've at the regular run of show tango off lima podcast we had an opportunity to uh speak with Jessica Lynch, who you, who you noted, um, within the, within the same POW span, um, and I remember interviewing her, and I was very teared up because that was one of the first times I had learned about women's roles in combat, and I had, up until that point, had an understanding of women in in, in combat and roles, but knowing when that happened, 
and knowing how quickly like Jessica Lynch's like story came out. I remember writing a report on that in middle school and I had read about the events of Shoshana and all of the folks um, in, in the span of time early on um, in the first few years while we were, oh, we were in Iraq. And it's, it's incredible to me that in that we still have conversations of you know mm, collecting my thoughts I have have so many just swirling around as I reflect on my own time and place of where I was when I learned about that to knowing that Shoshana's story about her captivity you know yeah I, I imagine all this difficulty in the physical and emotional challenges after returning for something so heinous um well one thing one thing that kept her going was her faith she had a she her faith was very strong and she prayed prayed continuously while she was in captivity 22 days as a prisoner um but she also had this dream that she talked about in one in one account that i read that she and her mother and her sisters were shopping and eating together in el paso and to her that was a sign that she was going to get out of this. She was going to make it home. She had constant pain. I mean, you've been shot in both both feet. But all, somehow, when they when the Marines rescued her, she was able to hobble out uh, upright somehow. And they asked the they asked how how did you do that with two so badly wounded an- ankles? And her word to this website called El Paso Matters was one word: determination. Can you imagine having the determination to get up onto two shot ankles and march out or to stumble out, hobble out upright while the Marines are carrying you? And I'll tell you what, she later, um, she became a, a part of these studies at, at, the, at the Robert E. Mitchell Center for Prisoner of War Studies in Florida, where they, you know, study physical, mental and emotional effects of captivity. And, um, you know, there were a lot, a lot of things and a lot of treatment that would come along in time to come. Yeah, I mean, Shoshana's ordeal led to immediate changes, um, immediate, we'll put air quotes on that, immediate changes in the U.S. military, including improved training and equipment for all soldiers, regardless of their role. She continues to share her story and inspire others, just like I'm inspired right now, and raise awareness, of course, about physical, mental, and emotional effects of trauma. Her resilience and determination are just powerful examples of courage in the face of adversity. I, I I know that she is, uh, she credits her her church, and she credits her involvement with veteran service organizations, the Military Order of the Purple Heart, and the American Legion. And it's fun to think about, or interesting to think about, that her American Legion post in El Paso once a month, she applies those culinary skills. She got a degree in culinary arts after she got out of the service, and now she cooks once a month at her American Legion post in El Paso. So we. Uh, we're definitely interested in knowing more about that experience, but you know her story is is just so it, it's emblematic of the transition that went on between you know policy decision makers and today's environment. When now the percentage of women who serve in all of the U.S. Armed Forces is pushing twenty percent across all branches, and it's over twenty percent, I think, in a couple, and I think the Coast Guard is higher than quite a bit higher than that. So. You know, it's it's been a transition. It's been a, uh, but it's a transition that continues, and that that arc is not going down. It is going up. Absolutely, it, as as we transition, right? so far we've we've talked up to um, up to the Vietnam War, and I want to take just a step back because as we look at policy, there are important things that happened during the Cold War era, which went for a very long time and there are many women veterans whose stories that didn't necessarily feel like they were veterans per se due to the time period and if you for example we talked about vietnam in our previous episodes about how that was such a device a decisive war so you didn't really talk about service and there has been a lot of disenfranchisement with service in certain eras and with cold war era in particular and I'll let you talk a little bit more about it, Jeff, but there's a really important piece of, of policy uh, legislation, if you will, that happened on June 12th in 1948, the Women's Armed Service Integration Act. Um, that's when the United States 
put in, uh, put in a book two law that enabled women to serve in a permanent regular permanent and regular members of the armed forces in the army navy marine corps and uh, the recently formed air force this was signed by president uh, harry s truman and it granted women the opportunity to serve in regular permanent positions for the first time so we're talking now post-world war ii we are allowing women to have careers, which we see in the Korean War and Vietnam and during the entire span of the Cold War, where we're in this ideology tension of geopolitical rival between the Soviet Union. So even without direct military confrontation, it's characterized as this quest for global influence in the nuclear arms race between the two superpowers. So this is a unique time frame. But to set the tone for everyone to understand that June 12, 1948, maybe the most significant piece of, 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 of words strung together allowed women the opportunity to pursue legitimized careers in the U.S. military. So I will, I will toss it back over to you, Jeff, because... Well, right. And, then, and isn't that amazing that after all that we've talked about, from World War II back to World War One to the Mexican War, Mexican Spanish American War, the Mexican American War, the Civil War and the Revolution, and all of these, um, you know, military connections that women have had, that it took until 1948 for this to become. So I think we're going to go ahead and and say that this is a thing, and we're going to sanction this, and it is, and and literally now it is, it's like Shoshana is is a, is a great story of someone who chose military service as a as a way to pursue to for a better life to pursue some her, her dream and she wanted to serve her country like her dad did but she also had a you know a desire to use i'm sure her gi bill uh, uh, education benefits to go to culinary school after she got out of the service but in the meantime she got this incredible training in to be a cook for large groups of people that's kind of a thing that's a great great training so uh, the the opportunity to gain from military service that had prior to 1948, you know, had been largely denied. And the percentage of women who served, even though we've talked about the wax and the waves and the wasps and the and the the hello girls and all of the nurses and everybody who'd done this, it was still a super small percentage. Now, overall, you know, we see this, like I say, across the branches, it is, you know, pushing 20% now. And that's a that's a that's a big indicator, of, and it's a growing demographic. You know, the Cold War sort of began the the, the period, the post nineteen forty eight period, when so many changes were implemented, the military policy changes that gave women opportunities, fill a wider wider array of roles in the military, and inspired many to make a career out of it. This meant that more women would rise to the highest ranks of leadership. Absolutely. So there are uh, a few women that we put in the lineup to discuss today. One of them is Grace Hopper. I think she's a little bit more popular. Uh, she's definitely had her story shared a bit, but it'd be remiss if we didn't mention her because she was a pioneering computer scientist and a rear admiral in the U.S. Navy. Hopper's career, I mean, significantly shaped the American military and early computer industry as someone who likes tech. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> but serving in the Navy, she conducted top secret calculations at a Harvard lab. She essentially for national defense, rocket trajectories, table ranging for anti-aircraft guns, minesweeper cap calibrations. I mean, there wasn't anything that Grace could not do. And she also was behind revolutionizing computer programming within the Navy and coined the term debugging. Her remarkable achievements in tech and military service remain a lasting impression. Um, quite, a, quite an incredible individual who served during this time frame. Um, who knew? The, who knew, right? The term debugging came from this, yeah, wherever it came from, who knew? But I, I that it's just, these stories start to really grow as the as the century unfolds. You know, Admiral S Sandra L. Stoza broke barriers in 1990 when she took command of the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Katmai Bay, making her the first woman to lead a Coast Guard Cutter in the Great Lakes. But then in 
on you know her career goes on and she becomes the first woman to lead in 2011 the the a united states service academy she's the superintendent of the u.s coast guard academy and she was confirmed as a vice admiral in 2015 and her legacy extends across the sectors including military maritime homeland security and academia so you know this this admiral has broken barriers like so many women via the military as we've talked about dr mary edwards walker not only broke barriers for military but she broke barriers for medicine and um you know and and i think when you talk about grace hopper she was not just breaking barriers in the navy she was breaking barriers in technology and inventing the term debugging which i think is extremely cool very cool <laughs> uh speaking of incredible trailblazing figures Brigadier General Wilma Vaunt, I've had an opportunity to meet this woman and oh boy, the rap sheet. Not only is she known for her remarkable contributions during the Korean and Cold War eras, she spearheaded the creation of the one and only Women in Military Service for America Memorial or the Military Women's Memorial in Arlington National Cemetery and was the first woman in the comptroller field to reach the rank of Brigadier General. Among her accolades, more recently, in I believe 2023, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the Defense Distinguished Service Medal. Brigadier General Vaughn's legacy extends beyond her service, leaving a lasting mark and a whole memorial and education center recognizing women's contributions in the armed forces. Major General Jean M. Holm was the first female one-star general in the U.S. Air Force and the first female two-star general in all of the U.S. Armed Forces. She made just huge contributions in the integration of women into the military, certainly in leadership, was a trailblazer for women in uniform. And now, you know, we don't bat an eye when we hear about uh, stars uh, and women I mean, there are so many that are now, it's no longer, it's kind of no longer a story. And that is the story when women rise to the, to the to general officer. Absolutely. There's, there's one particular person that's not on our show that I want to mention, and it's um, Lieutenant Colonel Ruby Bradley, U.S. Army nurse. Bradley served during World War II and the Korean War. She was taken as a prisoner of war by the Chinese during the Korean War and continued to provide care to her fellow prisoners under challenging conditions. Somebody I just wanted to pop in there in this time frame because the Cold War technically 1947 to 1991, which is why there's such a range in the, in the women that we've mentioned here, right? From, right. from Hopper to um, Vaughn, to, you know, like, the, there are just these time periods where we recognize the service era, and then there are these gap times where if you're in peacetime, sometimes it doesn't hold the same clout as if you were affiliated with a conflict. And that's something that's been a conversation amongst even present day global war and terrorism veterans. Like, oh, I didn't go to Iraq, Afghanistan. I'm a non-combat, non-veteran, or non-combat, non-deploy veteran. Is my service still as valuable? So it's really important that we recognize these individuals, even though that they had some footing in a particular conflict of war, there are so many women veterans out there that served during this time period that do not have nearly enough recognition or their stories known. And that's tying back into, you know, uh, excuse me, um, Brigadier General Wilma Vaughn is she made a space for all of us to register and share our story. So if you're not familiar with the Military Women's Memorial or you've never visited, it's at the gates of Arlington National Cemetery. And that's my selfless plug. But if you haven't registered your story, you know of a veteran in this time frame, share that story and also hashtag Military Women Wednesday. Just saying, tag us, American Legion. That's my selfless plug. <laughs> Moving forward, let's talk about the, the Gulf War. Um, so for... So some some background information here. So during the Gulf War, women served in various roles. Again, combat support, medical units, their contributions to logistics, medical uh, support. We've got essential functions demonstrating capabilities of, uh, across combat environment and challenging previous limitations. This is a very interesting time frame, if you will, like flipping a new chapter. So the Gulf War, also known as Operation Desert Storm, was in response to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. The coalition of nations led by the U.S. liberated Kuwait. 
and it showcased the effectiveness of precision airstrikes and coalition warfare. So this is a very unique space that we find ourselves in. And yeah, a lot, of, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of pioneer moments in that, in, that, in that window of time. It was a very brief war in terms of combat time, but it was a, it was a volatile experience. I remember it very vividly. Uh, it was on CNN. It was the era of, uh, anyway, <laughs> after it was our, my generation didn't really know. We, we saw the Vietnam War when we were little kids, didn't have anything to watch, any war to see on TV until 19, into the early 1990s when we were watching the Gulf War and Desert Storm unfold before our eyes. Uh, Colonel Rondo Cornum, uh, who was a flight surgeon with the 229th Attack Helicopter Regiment during the Gulf War, uh, was in a helicopter crash there, and she was taken as a prisoner of war for seven days showed resilience and dedication to her fellow soldiers and you know again the 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 topic of women as pow's who we mentioned earlier that uh shoshana johnson later in iraq was the first black female pow um you know Rhonda cornum was a uh, famously a pow in the gulf war absolutely um other folks that come to mind uh, commander darlene Escara was a trailblazer in the u.s navy during the gulf war she became the first woman to command U.S. Navy ship in combat zone, where she took command of the USS Opportune ARS-41, a salvage and rescue ship. So, impressive. Her, yeah, Colonel Martha McSally was a U.S. Air Force veteran. She served in the Gulf War and later became the first American woman to fly in combat and command a fighter squadron. So, uh, you know, women in aviation start to really start to be a phenomenon even prior to 9-11. Absolutely. Um, Sergeant Major Michelle S. Jones served in the U.S. Army during the Gulf War and became the first woman to obtain the position of Sergeant Major of the Army, the highest enlisted rank. Her dedication to enlisted soldiers, amazing. And she still is a continued advocate. I have had an opportunity to meet her, Jeff. Outstanding. One of the most formidable women I've ever encountered. Um, and I've... Even in my own reflections, I remember the uh, VA had a 25th, it was like the 20, I think it was the 25th anniversary of the Women Veterans Center, the Center for Women Veterans. And I was in a room where she was there, General Wilma Vaughn, and some of these firsts of firsts. And I will never forget addressing that. Like being called up and to stand before these women was maybe one of the highest honors. And to know that she was in that crowd and I've been able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, she is an outstanding human being. So fun things as we get to reflect on our experiences as we have in all of these episodes is now that we know some of these people behind the bios, um, it's just, you know, they're putting their pants on one leg at a time, you know, <laughs> like they're just they're just yeah. um, outstanding human beings with well, purpose and uh, sergeant major of the sergeant major of the army is no easy task that is mm -hmm. about as complicated a task as there can be in upper leadership um so uh vice vice admiral vivian cray is u.s coast guard veteran who served during the gulf war and she made history another one of your firsts as the first woman to serve at the U.S. Coast Guard as the U.S. Coast Guard Vice Commandant, holding down various high-ranking positions throughout her career, but she was Vice Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard, which I think is a higher, I think, I, I, I maybe, I don't think I'm wrong on this. I think that they have the highest percentage of women in uniform among mm -hmm. all of the branches. I wouldn't doubt it. It's, you know, I, I think about my current friends, it, it just, just different women veterans I know, I got a lot of army gals and I got a lot of coasties, yep. you know, it's just for sure. I, I do have a, a great deal of Coast Guard friends. Um, and one I'm thinking of very fondly. She's a wonderful human being. Uh, but okay. So we've hit the Gulf war. We've noted some, some first of first, some folks that have continued to build right on these, these stepping stones, these new chapters, of, of service and diving into the global war on terrorism, right? We're thinking, we're talking about women who have served since terrorist attacks on 9-11, which is now 
20 plus years in the making, right? So everyone let that soak in. We're getting older time. We cannot elude father time. So, you know, global war on terrorism, long-term conflict against terrorist organizations, focus on Al-Qaeda and Taliban. We've got the attacks of 9-11 that triggered our involvement and it's just been this ongoing war. Well, cer- certainly one of the symbols of the of women in combat and, and, and in that in that situation is Tammy Duckworth, senator from Illinois, who is, you know, a retired National Guard lieutenant colonel who's been the junior U.S. senator sin- from Illinois since 2017. And she is a combat veteran of the war in Iraq, where she served as a U.S. helicopter pilot. And in 2004, her Black Hawk was hit by a rocket-propelled grenade fired by Iraqi insurgents, and that resulted in the loss of both of her legs and some mobility in her right arm. And despite these injuries, she continued to serve in the National Guard until her retirement as a lieutenant colonel in 2014. You know, her resilience and dedication have left a big mark on the U.S. military history. But again, you can look back to the women who continued to serve after they were injured or after they had faced some adversity, back to the angels of Anzio who had who were putting duty first you know, all throughout their lives, throughout their military experiences, and continued because their sense of duty came before their sense of self. Absolutely. And I, it's, this, is, we've, this is an important mention for any of the National Guard and reservist folks. Within the global war on terrorism, it's no secret that the National Guard played a large role in that war, on, in the war on terror, excuse me. And Guard and Reserve units made up roughly about 45% of the total force sent to Iraq and Afghanistan. That's right, 45%. And they received about 18.4% in casualties. So it's... It's an important footnote here that global war on terrorism wasn't just active duty. It was National Guard and Reserve folks that were being called up, like Tammy Duckworth, who was a National Guard lieutenant colonel. Um, so, for those who don't know, you know, National Guard and Reservists, you're you're part time. You still got to meet the standards of your your active duty um, components. And these were the folks that were being deployed overseas. Um, and having even my own firsthand experiences that, you know, I, I joined 2010, 2011 timeframe. And it's interesting when you, when you see, you know, only, you know, Tammy Duckworth only retired like four years after I started and raised my right hand. So now we're starting to creep up at this time frame of uh, reflection and inclusion of combat inclusion of, of all branches, the Guard and Reserve are, are called up and utilized more than I think people are real are people realize. I think we have a better understanding now, uh, particularly as we have uh, state uh, crises and and or could be called up for domestic um, needs. But that really wasn't a topic uh, outside of global war on terrorism. It existed, but it didn't have the same prowess as it does now. Um, and I'm thinking about a trailblazing aviator, um, Air, Air Force uh, Thunderbird, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Nicole uh, Makolchowski. She etched her name in history as the first female pilot selected to be the U.S. Um, Air Force Thunderbird. So that's the renowned aerial demonstration team. And her call sign was Fifi, resonated through the skies as she executed daring maneuvers. And I think about her and her endeavors, right? She's just left her mark in a world of aviation in this, you know, first 2001 to 2010, she was already taking to the skies and breaking through um, the Air Force Thunderbirds, which up to that point had been an all-male team. Yeah, you want to talk about all-male teams and the history of all-male teams, you got to go to the special Special operations and the elite units, and um, mm-hmm. in t- in 2015, history another famous first captain, uh, Kristen Grace is uh, she's the trailblazing army officer who shattered barriers for women in elite combat units when she achieved the distinction of as one of the two women to graduate from the U.S. Army Ranger School, and you know this accomplishment began. Uh, you know, open doors and inspired new generations for women in the military that if you can um, meet the qualifications, gender is not the issue. Yeah. Uh, 
I've had an, an opportunity to meet this this woman, and she is an outstanding um, beacon of hope for for many women who can, yep. you know, work towards and and have an example for them, uh, a, a leader, if you will, to show them how to get to that point and meet those standards. The army, the army's posted some good videos of her talking about leadership, and um, I think they're they're phenomenal. And she's she's a uh, obviously a figure who is that bold. And I think about, you know, the women who came before, there's a similar pattern here. They kind of have forced their way in the women who disguise themselves as men in order to fight in the, in the 19th century, you know, here, these women who have had to fight to get recognition on the national mall, they had to fight to get a combat MOS. They had to fight to get into ranger school. They had to fight to get into the, into the, into the academies. And then, become ultimately superintendents of these academies and and to be, and to distinguish themselves in combat it's it's just the 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 i think it, i think it plays a lot to not just maybe maybe it maybe plays something that there's something inherently deeply american about their their will and their desire to serve their nation even though it's very very difficult for them it was difficult for these famous firsts to become those famous firsts right. so they had such desire to serve their nation that i think within that you know their their passion to achieve freedom to to defend our country runs pretty darn deep and i think that that's what makes them special sure i i just think of that patriotic zeal that was uh written in the citation for dr mary walker uh, that is such a powerful theme that I've seen through all of the women that we've we've discussed, and uh, you know the list continues uh, as we. Oh gosh, let's see, who's next? Oh, Major General Tammy S. Smith served in Afghanistan from 2010 2011, and in 2012 was appointed as Brigadier General. This promotion, this is again, this is a first made her the first openly gay flag officer. Now, the LGBTQ plus community, that's a whole separate, like I wouldn't say separate, but the, the policies that, you know, um, don't ask, don't tell policies. We're in a time frame where that was, that was repealed, that was removed and found to be just ethical. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of, you know, mixed thoughts and opinions on that and, you know, respect that. This is an individual who, was on a, a national stage and has and was and still you know is very much so an authentic figure in um this movement we were again remiss to not mention someone who is a trailblazer in their own right specifically as we look at cultural engagement of diversity and inclusion inclusion in combat um you know, uh, and again, and again, I, I bring up the point that as the years unfold, and as the decades go by, it is not be it is no longer a front page story when a woman becomes a general officer in the armed mm -hmm. forces. I mean, this is you know you got there's it is becoming um, more common when you have twenty percent of your military are women. Some of them are going to become general officers, uh, even four star, up to four star generals. And there's no, re it, it's just, if you do the job, if you serve your country, regardless of, you know, what your MOS or what your, what your duty station or anything, it's, it's just the women have proven themselves in this, on this, envi in this environment. And I think it's very, um, it, but as we've tried to express throughout the show, this has been a journey and a hard journey, a long journey. And a lot of these famous firsts had to break through a lot of obstacles to get where they got to be. Yeah. Speaking of the stars, you going to tell me about someone else. Yeah. Admiral, <laughs> Admiral Michelle Howard, the first African woman, African American woman to command a U.S. Navy ship and to achieve the rank of four star admiral. Again, these are the four star admiral. And these general officers are starting to come up, starting to become, I mean, we don't do a story in the American Legion magazine because a woman becomes a, a major general or a, even a four-star general necessarily anymore. It is becoming normal, and that is the story. She also became the first female four-star admiral to command operational forces when she assumed command of the U.S. 
Naval Forces Europe and Naval Forces Africa. She retired in December of 2017 after nearly 36 years of service in the U.S. Navy. So salute to her. I, I, I that's a that's a it's a long career. It's a lot of mm -hmm. work, and I'm sure that you don't get a, you don't get that fourth star for just uh, showing up to work every day. That's mm -hmm. a, that's a that's a great great uh, a great officer and a great leader absolutely and um during this time frame uh the establishment of the u.s space force right. right that's that's pretty huge uh in this time span that we're discussing right and somebody of, of great interest to our audience is uh lieutenant general nita m r magno she was the first female general officer speaking of the stars for the u.s space force our guardians shaped the new, I will say, okay, the newest military branch's mission and organization. So in 2020, she served as the first director of staff for the United States Space Force, synchronizing policy plans, cross-functional issues, and her legacy will extend, has extended beyond military service. And she continues to impact national security through her work with Rocket Labs board of directors. So this is somebody who's ingrained and all of the things within the past five years, <laughs> building something new that people still giggle about. Let's be honest. Well, yeah, well, I, I, you know, we have a, a big piece in the magazine in the in the in the coming issue, the March issue, about the problem with space junk that is floating above our atmosphere, and it is not just like a oh, it's too bad we got such a mess up in the up above the atmosphere. No, we have a serious national security problem up there above the atmosphere, and Space Force is tackling that issue. That is one of the topics that they are, you know, we, there are dangerous problems. And today, uh, just just recently in the news, we heard about Russia, you know, sending a you know a nuclear uh, device into space to fire up on you know, their adversaries in space. I mean, okay, this is, this is not, I, I think that when you're going to need, we need good leadership in that, and that's in the space force. And again, another general officer. And again, uh, yeah, cool. It's just, we don't even bat an eye that it's a woman. And right. that's it's, where, that's where we've come. As it's a, definitely a, a new space race, if you will. Right. Yeah. Cause we started talking about, well, well put. Yeah. yeah space race. Uh, because yeah, we started talking about Cold War, right? And a lot of that was between, you know, ideologies and uh, and, and the space race, right? Um, to huge events from from walking on the moon to Sputnik to all of these amazing, amazing technological feats from Grace Hopper, you know, to debugging to um, all of these very common will, will be very common for for many women is they'll. Be like, oh, she's a general. That's that's amazing, right? It won't necessarily be the first of first anymore. It will become commonplace in a good way. Where right. this is this is an achievable outcome if you decide you want to make the military your career. You know, like with anything, you know, it's 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 been a beautiful beautiful journey as we continue to even reflect on things that have happened even in the past few years. So. Right, well, I yeah, I, well, they're and they're good ones. When you talked about, you know, Colonel Black, uh, who commanded the the wing at Hurlburt, and you know, these are big command, big officer commands, and big big important responsibilities. I think she had like three thousand plus uh, combat hours that she flew in her career. It's a, a crazy number of combat hours. Mm -hmm. She was a you know the this is this is not. Um, the the time gone by when you had to disguise yourself as a man in order to go fight for the freedom of your nation but you can check out our show notes learn more about shoshana johnson's story in particular that's what we've got in there and i really want to do a shout out to a website called el paso matters.org which really did a fantastic feature on shoshana and kind of the effects of that 507th maintenance company's experience in Iraq and how that led to changes that every, uh, I think it was an important point, every soldier would, and every member of the U.S. Armed Forces would hear from here, from here on out, 
would have to be indoctrinated into quote unquote warrior spirit and they would be trained to fight they would give be given weapons that work they would be given um all kinds of training that no matter what if you were in the rear there is no rear in a war on terrorism it's all a front and so anyway great story well done multiple audio clips good interviews with her and her pow metal citation is also in the in the show links so some good stuff there hope you can check that out Absolutely. Shoshana's story reminds us of sacrifices made by service members and their families. Her courage and resilience inspire us to overcome challenges and overcome adversity. And if you were remiss, we've done an excellent job. We've covered a lot, Jeff. We've covered U.S. military history in snippets, highlighting amazing women. And to know that there are so many stories that are still untold, it's incredible that we have such a, an overlooked contribution of diverse backgrounds and branches from the U.S. Revolution, uh, excuse me, U.S. American Revolution to the present day. And our goal today are, in these episodes was to really highlight in Military Women's History Month or Women's History Month is that women veterans are remarkable. Um, we have been an all-volunteer force since the creation of this fine country. And we're hoping that this engaging, informative podcast series sheds a light on how women veterans have, have been overlooked. We've shared some of those stories. We hope that you investigate those stories. We want you to, of course, register your stories, with Military Women's Memorial, share your stories with us, tag us, and hashtag Military Women's Wednesday. But thank you so much for enjoying, or joining us for this important series. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and share this podcast to honor the trailblazers who have shaped history. And like I said, if you have a story to share, post it on your favorite social media platform, tag the American Legion and use the hashtag Military Women Wednesday. We hope you've enjoyed these stories of outstanding military women. And thank you all to all of the women who have continued to serve and will continue in future generations to come to serve this country. So 